Good to see everyone. Hope you're having a good week. And we are glad to have any visitors that are here. It's an encouragement. There may be some visitors online. Even though we can't see you, we're glad you're here. And it is so good anytime we have visitors. And two of our visitors, among our visitors, are uh, Steve and Lenita Knup. Steve's going to speak to us this evening. And uh, he is the preacher at Fort Chiswell. And I've asked him just to give us an update on Fort Chiswell and let him kind of introduce himself rather than me trying to write it down and convey it like, uh, I know Steve's been there a number of years, but I don't know exactly how many. So if he remembers, he can tell us some, how long he's been there. A little bit about the congregation. We'd love to hear it, Steve, because we consist, consider y'all a dear uh, sister congregation. Okay, updates, updates. Uh, prayers for the West Side Youth Rally coming up on July 30th. Let's be praying about that. Uh, as well as save the date, West Side Ladies Day, October 8th. Speaker Sheila Butt. That will be good. Along with that, uh, the Turn, Turn, Turn Ladies' Day meeting, July 24th at 4 in the Fellowship Room, 24th. Also, Rocky Mount Ladies' Day, October 15th, coming up. Another Save the Date. Some good things coming up. Aren't you glad that we can have those things again? Don and Mitzi's new address will be in the bulletin. Coffee tomorrow, 9 a.m. in the fellowship room. A good way to start the day. And Kay's ladies, ladies class at 10 in the fellowship room. Okay. All right, prayers. Let's remember Lori Whitlow. Jean Argabright in their healing and rehab. Also Ashley Smith, Diane Smith, Darren Smith. Uh, remember those folks. Uh, I'm looking at a sheet that Jeff gave me. Remember Joe Hartman as she's scheduled for a procedure tomorrow, hopefully to do some uh, correcting of of some issues to help some issues she's having and let's pray for Joe. We know she's been through a lot. Pray for Glenn as he stands by her. Several have recently tested positive for COVID. Um, Mike, Rebecca, uh, Jeff said to add Fred to the COVID list. And Sandra and Glenn, neighbor's son, Matthew, and both grandsons. Remember these, that they will have mild cases and get through them in good shape. We're going to have a uh, song and then a prayer, and that's when the classes will be dismissed, and then Steve will come up at that time. Glenn Hartman, prayer. Okay, yes, seem kind of getting up, ready to move this way <laughs> from upstairs. <laughs> okay, good deal. All right, Jeff, you want to come up and lead us in a song?
We pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to come together midweek and hear another message from thy word. We pray that our speaker tonight may have a ready recollection of everything he has prepared. We we pray for uh, the people throughout the world, especially the people over in Ukraine. We pray that this war might come to an end and people may get their lives back. We pray for our country. We pray that our leaders might look to you for guidance and learn to work together for the benefit of our country. We pray for our sick, Heavenly Father. We pray that the doctors and nurses attending them might be able to help them regain their much wanted health. We thank you so much for our elders here. We thank you for their willingness to dedicate a portion of their life to lead us. We pray that everything they do will be pleasing unto you. Thank you for our deacons, our teachers, all the work they do. Thank you for our preachers, for the many hours they spend preparing lessons and help us to be better Christians. Pray that you'd forgive us of our sins, keep us safe and watch over us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here's what I would like for you to do this this evening. Take your Bible in hand and go ahead and be opening it to the book of Matthew chapter 5. We'll be there in just a moment, but I want to go ahead and get you to the text so I don't forget. Uh, Brother Jerry gave me a lot to say before I was to say it, and I've got to remember all I have to say. I'm Steve Knupp, and I'm glad to be here with you tonight. I see a lot of faces that I know from camp, a lot of folks I've had associations with throughout the years, and Jerry wanted me to introduce myself, and I don't feel like I need to, but I am from the Fort Chiswell congregation. Been down there 16 years now. He said if I could remember, and it's getting close to where you start forgetting as you get older. I don't know where the years have gone. We've had uh, great work there. It's uh, sometimes preachers say they talk about a honeymoon period, and we're still in our honeymoon with the congregation there. It's great work, great group of Christians, and we have been blessed to be there. Uh, the Lord has blessed our efforts. We have about, uh, I sat down and counted a few weeks ago, we have about 81 people that worship with us right now. Uh, they're not all there on any particular Sunday because we always have somebody sick or a family or two traveling, but... Uh, 
uh, we do all that we can in that area, and we certainly, we certainly have been blessed. I want you tonight for just a moment to imagine what it would have been like to have been in the group that was there and present to hear Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount. Have you ever wondered or thought what that would be like to be present on that occasion to hear what is, in my estimation, one of the best and one of the most perfect sermons that ever was preached on the face of this earth? And Jesus has taught them beautifully about the fundamentals of life. He's taught them about spirituality. He begins with what we call the Beatitudes. We know those. We're very familiar with them. And then he begins to speak the truth about the old as well as the new. You've heard it, it, it's been said. And then Jesus would say, but I say unto you, and I see it as somewhat a resetting, if you will, of those truths from the old law and resetting them for the time in which he is speaking for that society of that day and even for us today that we look at those things contained in chapter 5. And then as you go into chapter 6, and you begin to read there in the opening verses, and Jesus gives the idea of you don't do what you do so that others will notice you and see you and, and praise you. You do what you do because it's right. And God, who will see you in secret, he will then reward you openly. And then he also talks about treasure. You know, where, where is our treasure? Don't lay up treasure here on this earth where moth and rust will... Uh, will corrupt and thieves break through and they steal and he tells us where our treasure, our focus should be. It should be in heaven. You know, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And then again in chapter 6, he talks about the single eye rather than double vision religion that might have, you know, so much emphasis on the mammon of this world. And mammon's not necessarily a bad thing. Mammon represents the physical and I'll say this about mammon, as the King James puts it. You know, let's use the mammon. Let's use the blessings that God has given to us daily. And you, let's use those to praise God and glorify him in every way. And, and I see Jesus here is saying, don't put too much emphasis on the world's goods. You put it on the spiritual. And don't lose focus of that. Don't let the things of this world become so important to you that... You miss the point of what good stewardship is all about and even the acknowledgement. And we need to do that. Acknowledge God. He is the source of all our blessings. And then he gives that lengthy but beautiful description beginning. I love the section of scripture in chapter 6 beginning about verse 25. And uh, the fact that we as people, we should not have to worry. But we give priority to the rule of God in our hearts and in our lives. And he culminates in Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all the things we worry about, all the things as far as what will we eat and what clothes and you know, worrying about tomorrow and so on and so forth. He says all these things will be taken care of. Now, I want to stop here just a moment and give credit to whom credit is due. I heard Brother Neil some years ago before he came to this area, and he was holding a gospel meeting. And he was talking about this very verse, Matthew 6 and verse 33. And one of the things that he said has stuck with me, and uh, I share it everywhere I go. He talked about the idea that God, he made the statement, God's not to be first in your life. And, you know, I can see, you know, folks, uh, the, the, the reaction of hearing that. But he says God is to be center of your life. And perhaps he has said that here. If he hasn't, maybe at some point he'll bring that lesson again or bring that point again. But it really stuck with me. The idea of God is center of my life. And that's the idea you put forth. And you think about it. Everything else in your life will revolve around that. Everything else will fall into place if God is center of my life. And I love that thought. I love the idea of that. And so tonight, for just a few moments, I want us to see some prioritizing that we can do in our lives. To stop for just a moment and to hopefully see and understand what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and also to take the, the emphasis away from ourselves 
You know, too often in this world, we look about us and we see too many folks. It's a, it's, it's a world that's all about me, 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 I, 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 I. It's all about us. And so tonight, I want us to realize it's not about me, but it's about putting the emphasis on glorifying God, giving him all the praise and glory that is due him through my life and your life. And how can we do that? Well, let's begin. And I want you to keep Matthew 6.33 in mind. One of my most favorite verses in the Bible would be that. But let's go over to Matthew 7 and verse 12. We should know that verse. What's it called? The golden rule. Therefore, whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. It's the law and the prophets. And if we could just understand for a few moments... How to make application of this in our lives and especially in our relationships. Now, how many relationships do we think about it that where we meet someone and we know folks in, in our lives and they approach that, that relationship with kind of a selfishness? You know, what can I get out of this person that benefits me? What can I get out of this relationship that's going to help me and further me in some way? And and we do not and we should not approach a relationship that way, especially as God's people. But folks in the, in the world do that. You know, we all know folks in the world who want to be our friend. I've met folks like that. They want to be my friend, but they only want to be my friend because they want something from me. They want something out of that relationship. And, and it's a selfishness. And it, it seems that when things are going well for them and things are going smoothly, they don't want to be around Steve Knupp. They don't, don't want anything to do with me. But, you know, when they need something, they want to come and be my friend. Now, I've got to stop here just a minute and give a warning. I just realized y'all don't have a clock back there. I have no sense of time. Y'all used to have a clock back there. So if I get to going too far, y'all, somebody stop me, wave your hand or whatever. Uh, we have a clock on the wall at uh, Fort Chiswell, but I took the battery out of it. So, but you know, we think about these relationships in our lives. And if we take Matthew 6.33, seeking first God's kingdom, the, the, the priority of God in my life being not just first, his, his kingdom comes first, but God being center of my life. And then you combine that and, and keep that in mind as we look at these principles and you take Matthew seven twelve and all the relationships that we can have in this world and what we can do for others as we show them Christ living in us. And it goes beyond, it transcends all the, what I call the immaturity and foolishness and pettiness that some folks think, well, what can I get out of this relationship that's going to benefit me? And there are folks like that out in the world. And that's when they need to hear from me and from you and from others. It's not about you. And it's not about what you want out of the relationship. But it's about as we live the Christian life, as we live the lives of servants, and we have that servant heart attitude, and our priority is that we're praising and blessing God through our lives, that we can bring a greater benefit to someone else's life. Now you think about this, so let's apply this specifically to the family. You know, you might have a, a couple about to get married, young couple, and this is for us old married people too. We don't forget these things in our, in our home. You know, Matthew 6, 33, Matthew 7, 12, you know, that we're seeking first the kingdom and, and we're applying the golden rule. But you think about a young couple about to get married, and if they truly understand what the relationship is all about and their real love and a real relationship involves that, it's not just about me. That I'm not coming into that relationship and that marriage to find everything that I want and all the fulfillments coming my way, but I go into this relationship, this marriage, with a deep desire, first and foremost, to glorify God. And also to bring fulfillment and enrichment into the life of the person that I claim to love. And you think about that. If the husband and the wife go into that marriage relationship and they're reciprocating to one another, seeking first God's kingdom, 
treating one another with a golden rule, and it does. It begins in the home, and how important it is, and how much better our world would be if we're in the home. We're living these principles as husband and wife, day in and day out. Do we get it right all the time? Well, no, we fail sometimes. But we have that love for our partner, and we love them enough. We want to see them in heaven with us, and, and they reciprocate that to us. My dad always said, marry someone that will help you get to heaven. Young, young people, marry someone that will help you get to heaven. That should be your top priority at the top of your list. They might be good looking. They might be beautiful. They might be rich. They might be whatever. You fill in the blank, but make sure whoever you marry is someone that will help you to achieve that goal. And that, for us older folks that are married, are you continuing to do that in your relationship, helping one another along the way? And when we stumble and we mess up, and, and we do at times, and we, we may talk to one another in ways that we shouldn't sometimes, do we fix it? You see, it's not about me. But again, it's about glorifying God in our relationships and being thoughtful toward our partner, and they think that way. And, and the beauty of the relationship we have with God, think about that, is that he has given us so much. Think of all, of all the blessings. He loved us so much. He gave his son, and sometimes we don't even think to the degree of how great that love was. The example he gives for us. And he wants us to love him and serve him and thank him in return. And in the same way, we become unselfish like his son was, who was willing. Jesus said, I love you. I love you this much. He stretched out his arms. He goes to the cross, and he dies for each and every one of us. Now, I want to say this again. No home is perfect. But if there's not the spiritual development of the golden rule in the home, there will be problems. You will struggle. You know, if only one person in the family is practicing it, then that one person's going to have a difficult time. But you keep doing it, and you bring all the rest of the family along. But we need to have that in our homes, and it will permeate into the world and into our society. And that's the way we can make a difference in this world for good. The golden rule, do unto others. Now I want you to go over to Matthew chapter 20. Number two, number next. And in Matthew chapter 20, we have a story there, and I want us to see this. We've seen it's not about me in, in the home and our relationships, and I want, to, I want to go to another aspect of this. And in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus, he gives us this account, the story of this master, this householder, and he's, he's going out and he's employing folks to work for him. And he goes out early in the day, as we see in the text, and he hires a worker, and he says, I will pay you one denarius. Later in the day, he hires another. Same thing. And even later, and all throughout the day, he's hiring these, these guys, these folks to come and work for me for one denarius. And, and at the 11th hour even, we see where he hired yet some more. And then the quitting bell rang, and it was time to quit and go home. The day is finished. Every one of these workers lines up to receive their wages, and the one who worked, you know, that came on at the 11th hour, he's receiving the same as the one who was hired at the beginning of the day, who, who worked all through, as the text says, through the heat of the day. I've borne the heat of the day, and the complaint came, that's not fair. That's not fair. The master said, well, did you not agree to work for a certain amount? Well, yes. And the master said, did I, did I lie to you? He would no. Did I, did I fulfill my agreement? You received your one denarius. He said, yes. And, and the master could say, well, it's, it's not about you. It's not about you. You think about it this way. Here's a person that, that doesn't have a lot of the world's goods. And then over here is someone who, it just seems like they are blessed no matter what they do. Their, their crops are always a bumper crop as such. And they have a lot of the world's goods. But those folks who don't have a lot of the world's goods, and they're, they're trying to live their lives and live the Christian life and, and to serve the Lord faithfully and, and, and to serve and go to, to worship, not to church. We are the church, aren't we? 
But to go to worship and serve and, and give and materially, it's just not panning out for them. And it's a struggle and it's always a struggle. And yet here's that other person over here living wickedly year after year. And he has the bumper crops. And don't we want to say, well, it's not fair. It's not fair. Well, did God ever say it would be fair in this world where sin abounds? He didn't, did he? In fact, Jesus warns us, you know, it's not going to be equitable all the way around. Jesus says, you will have tribulation in this life. You're going to have those struggles. And it's going to be unfair in many, many ways. And so sometimes in our job, our vocation, our profession, whatever we do to earn a living, and sometimes we need to take a step backwards in our workplace concerning that and realize I am not the one to be pleased. It goes back to Matthew 6, seeking first the kingdom of God. God is to be pleased. And so in the workplace, as I go in day in and day out on my job, my boss or others that I work with or subordinates, folks who might work beneath me or beside me, whoever it might be as far as my job is concerned, they, they need to see in my life and in my demeanor and my dress and my attitude and my speech and every aspect of my life that I am a Christian. I'm living the Christian life. I represent Christ. I wear his name. Are we doing that? You know, it may or may not make a difference to our coworkers, but it's kingdom thinking. It's kingdom living. Doing it consistently. Now, if you want to be, if you want to be great at anything, and you may already know this, you want to be a good parent, you want to be a good worker, you want to be a good whatever, Christian especially, be consistent. Consistency will carry you further in life and even into eternity. Be consistent. And it's about having that kingdom thinking no matter what's going on in, my, in the workplace, whether I'm having a good day or a bad day, whether my coworker has stolen my lunch out of the refrigerator and he's now eating it and I have to go without lunch, it, you, you still you glorify God in your response to those situations. And if folks at work don't know about God, and folks at work don't know about Jesus and about his kingdom and about his church and about his plan of salvation and don't know that you are a child of God, time is wasting. You need to show them and you need to tell them, but especially show them in every aspect of your, your life and then they can develop a respect for you and they can come to praise, hopefully praise the same Lord and serve the same God that controls you. And controls me. Let's go over to John chapter 4. I want us to see something there in John, excuse me, John chapter 4. Jesus, as we know, he must needs go through Samaria. We're familiar with this story. I've heard a lot of good preaching out of this chapter. I love this chapter. There are certain chapters in the Bible and uh, this is one of them. And Jesus going through Samaria, and he's at Jacob's well. He's at Sychar. And he has that conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. And it's a very multifaceted conversation that they're having there. But one thing she says, she says, in this mountain is where we're supposed to worship. And you Jews, y'all worship over there in that city. You realize why she's talking about Mount Gerizim. That's where the Samaritans would go and worship versus Jerusalem. And she was a little bit confused about worship and talking about mountains versus cities and Mount Gerizim versus Jerusalem. And Jesus, what did he say in verse 23 and 24? Worshiping in that mountain or worshiping in Jerusalem was not the issue. The issue is, are you worshiping God in spirit and in truth? That's the issue. I want you to think about this. The externals of our worship. That shouldn't be the issue. Let me, let me explain what I'm saying here. The externals as far as when the Lord's Supper is served, when we come together on the first day of the week and we have our worship. You have your worship here, and it's much probably like at Fort Chiswell. 
And whether we serve the Lord's Supper before the sermon or after the sermon, that shouldn't be a, an earth-shaking thing in your life or my life. Or how many songs we sing before the opening prayer, whether we sing two songs or seven songs or five songs, it should not matter. The point is not the externals. The point is, are we worshiping God in spirit with the right attitude? And of course, in truth, the right pattern. And let me ask you this, when do you prepare for worship? How many times do we take the time, Saturday night even, to be thinking about tomorrow's Sunday? I'm going to worship God tomorrow. And I've tried to reset the minds of folks at Fort Chiswell. Don't think about, the, I hate the phrase, going to church. We are the church, people. We are the church, and what we do is we worship God. We are going to worship God, and when our mindset is, I am going before my Creator to offer to Him worship, and it helps us to have a better, to, to worship in spirit, to have a better attitude, a better mindset when we come together corporately and collectively to worship the God of heaven. But when does your preparation begin? For a lot of folks, it's when they get out of the car and lock the car and come in the building on Sunday morning. And that's all the thought that is put into it. And there are the folks, and I've heard them say it. I'm a preacher's son. I grew up in the church, as we sometimes say. And I've heard it all, even in the past 16 years in, in full-time preaching. And I've heard folks say, well, what do I get out of worship? What's in it for me? And there are folks who go into it with that type of attitude and they need to understand it's not about you. And it is not about me. And it's all about praising God and making sure that we're striving diligently to enhance the quality of life of others, that we get them to understand how important worship is, starting our week right. And therefore, when we come together and we worship God and we honor and we adore his name, and we teach, and we admonish one another, sure enough, we get a benefit, and we should. God understands that. But when we go into it selfishly, with that attitude, what's in it for me? What do I get out of the worship? And folks that think, well, preacher, I want you to entertain me. And I want you to get up and just tell some stories and tell some funnies and, and just make me feel good about myself for some 30 minutes or so, maybe 25 minutes, and, and entertain me. It's not about you, and it's not about your entertainment. It's about worshiping the God of heaven, seeking first the kingdom of God. And our worship is not, not to see what kind of buzz we can get out of it. That's what the world is centered on today. Too many denominations out there, and I say this in all kindness, but it's all about hey, how much frenzy can we get these folks into and, and what kind of buzz are they going to get out of this for themselves when we realize that we are in the presence of God, the God of heaven, the almighty God, the sustainer of this universe and this world. And we owe him reverence. We owe him praise that we come humbly before him on the first day of the week and we glorify him. And let me say this also, and hopefully it's a word of encouragement to some of the men and even the younger men. You know, when, when someone is standing before us, whether it's in a Bible study or in a worship, whatever the occasion is, and, and, and maybe they're struggling, they're reading from the Bible or they're trying to present a message, and it may not be well read. It may not be well presented, and our responsibility as children of God seeking first God's kingdom is that we ought to find everything within that, what that person is bringing before us that will help to feed me and to help make me a stronger Christian so that God gets more glory from my life and others will be helped and their quality of life will be enhanced because I have tried in a caring and unselfish way to help them. So in our relationships, it's not about me. In the workplace, it's not about me. In the worship, it's not about me. And we make sure that we have kingdom thinking. Well, listen, I want to look at just one or two more. I, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I guess I'm okay. Nobody's getting up and leaving yet. So go over to John chapter 21 with me. And this is, again, another one of the favorites in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. 
And in John chapter 21, here at the end of the book of John, and Jesus, he's been raised from the dead. He has accomplished his mission. He's raised from the dead. And this is, I understand, my studied opinion, his third appearance to his apostles. And within that chapter, he's having a, there by the Sea of Galilee, and he's having this conversation with Peter, with the apostle Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I do. Jesus says, well, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And Jesus then on that occasion, he's talking to Peter and he says, some are going to come and they're, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. And you're going to stretch out your arms and you are going to die. And Jesus was signifying, as we understand this, you know, what death... Peter would die. And of course, tradition has it, as many of us understand, that he was crucified upside down. He didn't deem himself worthy to be put to death or crucified in the same manner as was his Lord and Savior. And I want to say, I read somewhere, his wife was also crucified beside him. I think it might have been in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. I don't remember. But you know, about that time, Peter says, I think it's about verse 20 there in the text, he, what about John? Can you see Peter? Jesus is talking to Peter, and what is Peter doing? He said, what, what about John? And he's pointing over at, at, at the apostle John. What about him? And that's when Jesus said, what's it to you? What's it to you? Peter, are you listening to what the message, what I'm trying to tell you? Are you paying attention to what I am trying to tell you here? Are you still worried about John? Are you still looking at John? And here's the lesson for us, the important thing we draw from this. In, in our, our work as Christians, our lives as Christians, too often we want to say, well, what about him? And what about her? And what about them? And we're so busy pointing the finger at everybody else when we need to be thinking, well, what about me? And where am I at in all this? And how am I doing? The issue is, is God getting glory from the life I am living and what I am doing? Is God being praised because I'm blessing the lives of others and who cares about my spoiled brat mentality? Who cares? And so we need to ensure that no matter where we fit in in our service to God, within the Lord's kingdom, in, a, in the work of the church, uh, wherever we are at in that, whether we're in leadership, serving as an elder or, or as a deacon, you know, in servanthood as a Bible class teacher, or whatever it might be, wherever we fit into this, that we look and examine ourselves and we realize it's not about them and them and him and her, but it is, in this case, about me and how am I doing? And is it my desire to put God and his service first in my life? How often do we pray that God empowers us, helps us with the abilities and the talents that he has given us to do what we need to do in his kingdom? There is so much, I'm sure, the talent. I don't know many of you personally, but I think about just the talent perhaps that is that exists in this room and when you pull that talent and the resources that are available here at Westside and what are you doing with that? And I know you're doing great things. I get your bulletin every week. I look forward to it. And I see great things. But let's make sure we never get in into that mindset because sometimes the easiest thing and, and we want to do this and we might catch ourselves doing this, you know, let somebody else do it. I've even heard, and this is for the older members, and I'm getting close to being in that class of folks, the older folks who say, well, I've done it all my life. It's time to retire and let the younger folks do it. You don't retire in the Lord's kingdom. You don't retire in the, uh, in the Lord's army. You keep on fighting until the very end. You don't let up. Keep on keeping on. And if enough folks think that way as far as let somebody else do it, nothing will get done. I've seen that happen in congregations. Perhaps you have too. And selfishness, as I see it, has no place in the Lord's church. Selfishness, giving and serving is the Lord's way, glorifying God in all areas. How am I doing, Jeff? Got a little more time. Let's go to Luke 15. I got another one I want you to see. And we, this, again, we should know this parable. I've, I've always... Uh, identified Luke 15 as uh, the lost chapter. Lost things is what I wrote in my Bible. 
Because that's what this, this, this chapter is all about. Where for you get over there, you'll have the aha moment if you haven't already. You know, it begins with the idea of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And the lost sheep got lost because, well, sheep are dumb. They just wander off and get lost. And the lost coin got lost because, well, somebody else perhaps was responsible. The lady was careless. She, she finally found it. But we come to the, the, the lost son, the prodigal son. And he got lost because he had in his mind, it's all about me. It's all about me. Goes to his father, where's my money? Where's my inheritance? I, I have somewhere to go, and, and I want to go, and I want to have fun, and I have things on my mind, and I have miles and miles to go before I sleep, and, and it's party time, and where is my money? And, and I want my inheritance, and we know the story. He got his money, and he went off, and he squandered it. He was a party boy. That's all it was. Squandered it in riotous living. Ran right through his money. Because he thought it was all about him. That's not the end of the story. And that's not the point I want to make about this. I want us to see that. But you keep on reading. And we oftentimes forget about the older son. The older brother. He stayed home. Yep, he sure did. And he obeyed the rules. He's staying home and he's obeying the rules and he's obeying the rules and he kept the rules and kept the rules and kept the rules and he thought it was all about him and being at home and obeying the Father and keeping the rules and he's a little bit self-righteous. And the younger brother, the young son comes home. He's not glad to see him at all. He's come back. That son of yours, you, you ever pick up on that in, in, in the, the story? What he says to his father, that son of yours. I've had my wife say that to me a time or two about our son. I knew he really was in trouble. We do that, don't we? That son of that daughter, that, you know. But here he is, that son of yours. And he's complaining, you never gave me a young goat. Now I make merry with my friends. It's all about me. That's the older brother. It's all about me and I stayed home and I kept the rules and I have been... Boringly and laboriously keeping the rules and doing what you told me to, and I don't get to have a party. Well, it's not about your party. Party, party. It's about bringing glory to God and helping folks. And here's the point. If I stay home and I keep the rules, but yet I cannot forgive my brother, there's a problem there. Something is wrong. Let that sink in for just a moment. You know, Jesus is teaching in this very parable a very powerful point that says we need to learn forgiveness. And we need to learn compassion. And here's Jesus who, above all things, was criticized. He's criticized for eating with the, the, the publicans, the tax collectors, and he's eating with the sinners. And yet, here are three parables where, where he teaches us there is something beyond that. And if I don't get this message, I'm not going to do much with evangelism, am I? Think about that. If I don't learn forgiveness and learn compassion for those out in the world, I'm going to judge somebody unfit for the kingdom. The older brother was doing that. He was making a judgment about the younger son who, as I see by implication, is repentant of his evil ways. He's coming back to the father. The best part of that is when the father ran to meet him. Most of us know, perhaps, that all, men in that culture in that time did not run. It was undignified. Did not run, but the father ran to meet his son. And the older brother was just, he was eaten up with, with resentment toward his brother. You know, it used to be years gone by, a lot of years gone by when I think about it. When my dad first started preaching, I was a young man, about 10, 11, 12 years of age. This was back in the 70s. I'm going to date myself a little bit. It used to be guys with long hair. You didn't teach them the gospel. Those young men, those hippies, I think was the word back then. You remember that, Jeff? You're not quite that old, are you? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we, we don't take the gospel to people like that. People like that deserve to be in the sewer. And I even heard a preacher one time that told the story. He said there was a, a, a man that had a car wreck. 
and, and, and the fellow was sitting in his living room watching TV, heard the wreck, and went out there to see what happened, saw the guy laying in the ditch. He had long hair. He doesn't deserve to be picked up out of the ditch. And this really happened, and the guy went back in and turned his TV back on. Luckily, someone got him out of the ditch and got him to the hospital. But think about that. And today it may be a little different. It may not be the hair thing. It could be tattoos or piercings or whatever. The folks that are just a little bit different than I am, that dress differently or skin color is different or the neighborhood they come from. And and we want to kind of go around those folks and find somebody who's more like me to teach the gospel to. And sometimes, just like that older brother, it's about me and my standards and my prejudices and my foolishness and what I want and what I want and what I want when Jesus says you throw out the net throw out the lifeline doesn't matter how long the hair is or what ink is on their body or tattoos or whatever or piercings Jesus says you've got to love them love them enough to get out there where they're at, love them too much to leave them where they are, but help them. And may God be glorified in that evangelistic effort as you reach out to others. Don't be like the big brother. We need to be unselfish, putting others before ourselves. Well, I've got one more, and the lesson will be yours. I guess I'm going to make it in under the... It's in the Old Testament. You remember in 2 Kings chapter 5, if you want to go there, story of Naaman. We know the story of Naaman, don't we? Great military leader. He's a powerful man. He has leprosy. It's a death sentence. This is a disease that no one can heal. No doctor, no amount of money. Nothing will heal leprosy at that time in that culture. There is nothing medicinally that can be done. He's dying. He's this powerful. He's a military man. But he's told, you go see that prophet over there, and that prophet, will he'll cure you. I see a Naaman in my mind. Perhaps you do too. He gets his entourage together. It's not just Naaman you know, riding over on a horse. He's got this whole caravan of folks. He's going to make this entrance. And he goes to where Elisha is, and Elisha doesn't even come out. We know that. We know he sends a servant out. Tells him what to do. Tells Naaman where he's got to go. I've got, you know, you've got to go dip in the Jordan River, and you've got to do it seven times. And he's thinking in his mind, the Abaddon, the Farpar Rivers, they're much cleaner than that nasty Jordan River. And actually, they, as I understand geographically, they were twice as far away. But he's mad after he's been told what to do. He's all upset. He's, the King James says wroth. I like that word. It's a matter than a wet hen, I think, is what my mom used to say. And when she said that, you knew somebody was mad. They were angry. And I see him out there, Naaman, and he's stomping around. And what is he saying? Behold, I thought, behold, I thought he had in his mind how this was going to go down, that this prophet was going to come out and do all this, you know, yeehaw all over me and wave his hands and do stuff and cure me of my leprosy. Well, Naaman, it's not about you. And it's certainly not about what you think. And the world needs to learn that lesson. As you think about the world, lost and dying in sin, and there's nothing, just like leprosy of that time, there's nothing that can remove the stain of sin. And folks were out there, and when you tell them what they need to do, like Elisha through his servant, and I think it was Gehazi that you read about in the next chapter that was sent out there. But anyway, the servant, after telling him that, and, and it made him mad, and when we go and tell folks what God wants of them, and what do they do? They're just like Naaman. and they're stomping around, and they say, well, behold, I thought, here's how it's going to be, and I'm going to tell God what I'm going to do I've got a lady that lives right next door to me that's just like that she thinks on the day of judgment she's going to tell God how it's going to be we've done all we can for her sometimes folks just won't listen but uh, for Naaman and for so many out in the world it's about a commandment from God on this case it was a commandment from God through his servant of what you are to do and you do it with humility you do it with contrition you do it with obedience you do it penitently and don't walk around Naaman thinking and claiming that you're in charge because you're not and we need to tell folks that same thing today and when Naaman did what he was told to do, he goes and he dips in the Jordan River. We know the story. Seven times. And his flesh was restored. 
and begins to reveal a commitment to the God of heaven. He's told to go in peace. It's a great ending to a, a great story, I think. Great application. An Old Testament story with so many New Testament applications for us today. And so tonight, as we, we close this lesson, think about where you fit into this. As you and I, respectively, we worship God and we serve God and we strive to serve Him and we have the opportunities in, in our respective communities to go out and make a difference in the life of others. And do we do it through our relationships and realize it's not about me, it's about seeking first God's kingdom and in the workplace and in my marriage and in all the other situations, am I truly living, Matthew 6, seeking first God's kingdom? Kingdom thinking. Or are we like the world, self-centered and selfish, egotistical? Are we unselfish? Are we Christ-like? Are we humble? Are we willing to give? Are we willing to forgive? Are we willing to bear and forbear? Willing to, to go beyond the call of duty with a heart that is committed to the God of heaven, to Jesus and his kingdom. We think about Naaman. He was dying of leprosy. Till he decided to be submissive to a commandment of God. How about you tonight? I don't know the audience that well. We may not have anyone here that's of accountability that has not been baptized. But if we do, why not tonight? Why not come saying, I repent of sin. I don't want to sin on purpose anymore. And confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess your belief in him as the Son of God. And be baptized to wash your sins away and begin that journey of life. That's where it begins. That's not the end. So many folks say, well, I'm baptized. I got my ticket punched. I'm going to go to heaven. There's a lifetime of service ahead of us. Serving is God's way. Seeking first the kingdom. Or if you're here tonight as a child of God and your focus has not been as it should be, recommit yourself, rededicate yourself, have that kingdom thinking. And if there's sin in your life of a public nature and you brought reproach upon the church, I know... This, this family here will pray for you and with you that God will forgive you. But if you have a need tonight, I assume I'm extending the invitation. Is there an invitation song? Okay. You have the opportunity to come as we stand and sing. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring how my Lord was crucified. No. Thank you, Steve, for that good lesson. What's that? I didn't see you in the audience. I was here. I was here. I was just, I was, I was hiding behind Cookie there. I wanted to make eye contact with you. You know, we used, we used to say that when we came to the, the crossroads of life, we do the WWJD, what would Jesus do? 
But really, when we come to those crossroads, a better way of looking at it is what would Jesus think? Because it's all about kingdom thinking. So I really appreciated that. Good lesson tonight. Let's close our time together with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are so very grateful that we could be here tonight. We're thankful for uh, Steve and for the good lesson that he presented to us, for the thought that went into it and the study behind it. We pray, Father, that we will indeed be mindful of, well, of the kingdom and how we think about the kingdom. And as we find ourselves in those difficult spots on occasion and wondering which direction we should go, help us to think about what Jesus would be thinking about. And we know that that, would, that that means how can we honor you. Father, we thank you again for, for Jesus and what he means to us. And it's through him we pray. Amen.